Ah, okay, everybody has to click themselves in. So it's been a uh, lot, lot happening in the um, Kevin Griffin Dharma teaching world. <laughs> like every other day for the last, and sometimes twice in a day, I've been teaching. So, um, but uh, there's no end of of things to talk about with the Dharma. I, I, um, well, I, I do usually like to say the date. So this is Tuesday. April 16th, 2024, for the recording's sake. Um, and, you know, I've been working somewhat with this book more than mindfulness. Uh, as I was looking at it uh, yesterday and this morning, I, um, you know, people are just really boring in here. Uh, I uh, was... In the, this particular um, talk that is, you know, these are like transcribed talks uh, that I've gotten to is by Ajahn Sona. Uh, it's called Focused Attention, Panoramic Awareness. And a lot of it is about what's called Sati Sampajana. So Sati is mindfulness. Sampajana is usually translated as clear comprehension, but like what's the term he's using? Um, sorry. Panoramic Awareness. So, but it, it brought to mind for me um, one of the very first uh, Buddhist books that I read back in around 1980, 81. It's called The Heart of Buddhist Meditation by Nyanaponika Thera, who's a kind of a famous monk. Um, it, it's, let's see, the first published in 1962 um, and it's it's about the four foundations of mindfulness uh, that sutta and it, it it's one of the first places where I ever read anything that had a sutta in it and I didn't remember much about reading that part because mostly I read the the texts uh, that he wrote and um, and he he describes it uh, clear comprehension, the sati or the sampajana aspect, and um, you know it's based on sort of the commentarial uh, writings and which is kind of the the Vasudhi Maga I think and but uh, you know it's it's an interesting text if you're you know, somebody who likes to dig in deep into the Dharma teachings, because this is one of the first, like, English versions of something that's, like, really studying this, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. Um, so people like Bhikkhu Bodhi and uh, Venerable Analia would have sort of started here in, in a lot of their own study. Um, so it's called the Heart of Buddhist Meditation, and I'm gonna put the uh, yeah I'm gonna put the uh, author's name because you'll never Neon <laughs> Anika Tara and Tara I think is more of a um, honorific. Uh, People are still appearing. Uh, so the heart of Buddhist meditation. Uh, again, like this is not a, your, you know, uh, lightweight, <laughs> you know, uh, easy reading type thing. It's it's more more academic, but but it does, you know, give you things that are kind of more hardcore. You know, let's just say. Which you know, I think, uh, as you as you practice over the years, you know, there's there's um, you know, I think most of us go through kind of a process where we start with things that are very accessible to us, 
and then we get interested oh what's where did that person get their ideas and you know oh where's that where's that coming from and you you just keep digging uh, you know the the funny thing to me when i when i see an article in the new york times that's quoting a bunch of you know psychology professors my first question is like what, who did they meditate with? Who were their meditation teachers? Because I, I can tell that they've done retreats. You know, I can tell by what they've they're saying that they've been on meditation retreats. And I, you know, uh, that that's to, you know, their PhD means nothing to me <laughs> as a Buddhist. What? Uh, tell me who your teacher is and how many retreats you've sat, and then I'll then I'll know whether I, you know, believe anything you're saying. And I just want to be clear that I'm not judgmental at all about anything. So don't uh, get me wrong. <clears throat> all right. Well, that was, I think, uh, I broke the third, fourth precept there because I was saying something that isn't true. So uh, we're going to meditate. Finally, you're like, when are we going to meditate and stop talking? Breathing out, breathing in. And just settling into your posture. I was feeling how the body is being held. So we begin with the typical balance of ideas. One is the idea of sitting upright, having a, a strong posture, being stable. And then the contrasting idea is that of softening. It's kind of like hanging, hanging from a skeleton. body, the flesh, soft muscles, released, tension, dissolving. And bringing attention to the sensations of breath. And the body is sitting still, but the breath continues to move within the body. And as we begin a period of meditation, attuning to the energetic state 
How are you feeling? What is the thrust of your mind right now? Are there worries or concerns that are capturing your attention? They're generating thoughts, generating feelings. Or are you relatively at ease right now? This isn't about judging what's happening, just seeing it clearly with openness and acceptance. The seeing clearly itself does much of the work of meditation. We don't have to try to control the mind, control the thoughts, control the feelings. Just try to watch them without getting swept away. The practice of mindful breathing is structured by the Buddha to take us through the different aspects of experience, starting with the body. using the breath and awareness of the whole body to ground us in the present moment and eventually to bring a degree of calm or tranquility where we might spend our entire sitting period just working with this, it's a very fruitful approach to meditation, just awareness of the body and the breath. If a good degree of settling happens, of calming, and we are pointed towards the feeling realm. We 
attuned to the energetic state. When we start to see the interplay between feelings and thoughts, between breath and feelings. At this stage, there's a blending of awareness of the breath and body with awareness of the healing realm. And again, not in the effort to directly control the experience, but rather seeing how just staying with the observing process, the investigation of experience, that in itself has a natural clarification, a clearing and calming. So that the feeling realm may become transformed as well to a pleasant, serene state. Again, not setting this as a goal or striving, but nonetheless, if these states begin to appear, embracing them, holding them in awareness, appreciation, breathing with the feeling realm. What emerges potentially then is the broader awareness, the, the mind itself, the container in which body and feelings are experienced or known. This is an even more subtle awareness. We breathe with this as well.
and much more practice seems to be about stepping out of the thought world into the knowing world, body feelings, awareness. Thoughts are so persistent and encompassing our attention, they capture our attention. And then if we are trying to meditate, when we become aware of the thoughts, this can trigger another kind of adverse reaction to frustration or struggle or judgment. So perhaps the most important attitude is the attitude of acceptance, not judging ourselves, just understanding it's the nature of mind to wander. And even as we try to work on these subtle realms, understanding that the mind often has other plans, not Fighting with that, but not just allowing that, continuing to make a gentle effort, come back to the present moment.
Okay. That was a little more talking, a little more instruction than I usually give, but um, you know, I've been working with this sort of form that uh, based on the Anapanasati Sutta and and uh, so I've cut my meditation instructions have been kind of built now around these first three aspects of that sutta, which has four aspects. The fourth one is the insight uh, aspect, and and it's that's all based in the Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. But um, you know. Um, I guess I'm trying to give a more complete um, idea of what the practice uh, entails. So I think um, we can get a very uh, limited idea of what practice is about if we just are given, you know, to, uh, the most basic instruction. So a couple things before I start. Um, I see some people. I, I don't know if people are having trouble with the Zoom getting into this class, but um, let me see if I can bring up something that might be of use. Uh, um, no. I'm just. I, I really. Uh, uh, I, I kind of feel like I've lost control of Zoom, so uh, I really don't know um, what is happening with it at this point uh, or how how it's operating. So there is a link on my Zoom meetings uh, page that's supposed to be the link to this class. It says registration link. So I guess uh, and once you get that, Maybe you guys can tell me once you register for it, doesn't doesn't Zoom send you then the the link for the class? And what you need to do is like save that somewhere <laughs> so that you don't have to go through the registration process all the time. Am I hitting on it properly? So so for those who might be struggling, that's the key is to like get, once you get that email from Zoom, don't lose it. Like put it aside or copy it and paste it into something or bookmark it or, you know. Uh, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, if you are in the Bay Area next month, I'm going to start up uh, my monthly class at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, which has been on hold since the pandemic. Uh, it's going to be an in-person class, and I believe it's going to be strictly in person. I after teaching at um, Napa Valley Insight last week, where they do not do hybrid, uh, I just felt like, oh, I see how that is. If you don't l make it hybrid, then people might show up. Uh, and and of course, there I'm here every week on Zoom, so it's not like you know I'm cutting people off. You addicts, you. Uh, you know, but but I think there's a value in just having something that's just for the people who who appear and come in person, and, and um, not to mention that it's easier technically. But in any case, it's going to be the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, it used to be the fourth Tuesday. The second Tuesday, seven thirty p.m. The Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, which is at twenty three o four McKinley Street, Berkeley. Uh, have I put it on my website? Let's see. Uh, you know, managing my so-called business is not my favorite activity or my best competence. No, it's not on my website. So I have something to do later today. I will put that on my website. But um, if you can remember the second Tuesday, uh, so that'll be... The first meeting will be in May on May. Uh, next month is May, right? Yes. Uh, May, oh, it's not going to be until the 14th because the 
because the first of May is on a Wednesday. So it'll be May 14th, which is uh, Stevie Wonder's birthday. But why do I know that? Because he's born exactly two months after me in 1950. So anyway, uh, you know, random things that, uh, I, you know, once I'm senile and losing all memory, I'll still remember like Stevie Wonder's birthday, but I won't remember my name. Uh, so, um, all right. And I, I was talking with, uh, some of you might have heard me chatting with uh, Flo at the beginning of class that I am going to be teaching a short retreat in Alabama for the Flowering Lotus Meditation Group uh, June. Um, let's see, maybe that's on my website. It'd be nice. Yes. <laughs> It says it's a retreat in Mississippi, but that's because I had the wrong place. Anyway, uh, you can get information from that. Uh, yeah, I should actually update that. But anyway, yeah. So I'm going to be in the South. I've never been in Alabama before. Uh, that's uh, There's only two states left, Alabama and Mississippi. Then I will have covered all the states in my lifetime. Then I can die. So, all right, um, let's get it together here and talk some Dharma, okay? So um, we've been going through this great book, uh, More Than Mindfulness, which is available for free download on the Abhayagiri uh, website. I know I can spend the whole class just, you know, putting things into chat, byagiri.org. Um, you can download it and put it onto your Kindle or your iPad or something, or you can actually write to them and ask them to send you a paperback copy, which I did. Which I, pretty rare. Usually I just go up to the monastery, but I was greedy. Um, and so, so we're on this chapter called Focused Attention Panoramic Awareness by Ajahn Sona. There, I was going through the notes on it and going through the chapter this morning. There's so much in it that we could spend, you know, a month on this, but but I want to try to keep it to um, just today and just do one, one day on each chapter or maybe two days. But um, just if, uh, if there's a part of the the talk that I want to kind of land on, but but I'll I'll go through a few of the things that that I found striking. You know, I, first of all, he just it's interesting the way he kind of he's talking about the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. So just for those you know who care, the Satipatthana Sutta is in the middle length discourses. So it's the four foundations of mindfulness. And then there's a slightly larger version that doesn't actually have any more instructions in it. It's basically the same thing with extra uh, details, uh, uh, more about like who was there at the talk. And, um, and that's called the Maha or greater Satipatthana Sutta. And it's in the long discourses, the Diginakaya. But in in any case, he, he talks about how it's, as he says, treated as a holy text, as though it came, well, uh, he says, well, uh, uh, it's treated as a holy text, which is complete and came whole from the mouth of, uh, of the Buddha at a certain point in history. Uh, I would suggest this is not a piece of music. It is not a cantata by Bach or anything like that. This is a collection which was given over the years in many different situations. So that that makes sense that these suttas aren't, you know, they're not recordings. They are they are kind of distillations uh, and and compilations of things the Buddha taught. Uh, he spent some time talking about how memory is, uh, and this is kind of interesting. How the the word sati that we translate as mindfulness um, is uh, means it comes literally from the word memory in Sanskrit and, and I guess in Pali, um, and. 
there's been a lot of discussion and you hear different viewpoints about why the Buddha used this word and what it, therefore what it really means. So this is one of the things that happens as you start to dig into these teachings. Like, you know, you get a Dharma talk that, you know, and somebody, you know, talks, tells you what mindfulness is and it's like quoting, you know, John Kabat-Zinn or something, you know, okay, I got, I got it. Right. Then start to read some other things and you're like, wait a minute, what? Is that what the, and then next thing you know, you're like totally confused and don't know what the heck mindfulness is anymore, even though you thought you knew it. So this idea of, of mindfulness as memory, as I say, there's different takes on it. Venerable Analio, who's really one of the preeminent scholars, uh, says that if you are being mindful, you will remember what you did when you were mindful. So that's like one odd way of doing it, you know, okay. Um, Ajahn Sona, let me see if I can find where he goes into this. Um, he talks about like, uh, so, so he's drawing on, well, no, that's not helpful. Sorry. Um, oh, I, I, I have like so many notes here. It's like I practically transcribed the talk. Um, but, but he's talking about like a monk. Uh, he gives the example of being a monk and remembering when you're in public, you are an example to people. So it's like remembering in this circumstance what's appropriate. So that's an interesting take to, to, you know, and I make it even simpler, which is just trying to remember to be mindful. That's the hardest thing about mindfulness. It's easy to be mindful when you remember, like mindfulness itself isn't that difficult. Like, oh yeah, I can feel myself breathing. Yeah, no big deal. But, you know, the two things that are difficult are remembering to feel yourself breathing and then to sustain that attention. The the sustaining the attention is concentration, but the remembering is the sati. So, and then, so that, you know, that, that kind of, you know, then has a broader meaning like what, What's the appropriate thing to remember right now, if that makes sense? So what I mean is, I'm in a situation like I'm driving, and what's the appropriate thing to be mindful of right now? What if, like, we forget that we're driving, right? We get into like, you know, where somebody calls us on the, in the car, and we forget we're driving, and, and it's like we're paying attention to talking. But that's like not the thing that we should be paying attention to. Like, wait, I'm driving. Remember that, right? So that that is interesting. And then from, from a viewpoint, remembering what is the applicable Dharma teaching in this situation. When you're at a funeral, you know, there you know, you it's not the time to focus on, let's say, joy or uh you know mudita you know it, it's a time to f focus on impermanence maybe and compassion and forgiveness right so we sort of this is about being and so, and so sampajana so sati sampajana is this connection mindfulness and clear comprehension that is said to really encompass what mindfulness is about. That's that mindfulness is more just the focusing on the thing, but Sampajana is having the bigger picture and seeing the, the context and the appropriate thing to pay attention to and, and the appropriate lens to take when, when focusing on something. So this is, uh, to me, uh, uh, really, I mean, to me, whatever, this is a vital 
aspect of practice. We can we can get lost, and this is why I was talking about wanting to teach the more than just mindfulness of breathing, but take people through feeling and and awareness or mindfulness of mind, because the question kind of comes up: Why am I doing this? So uh, Ajahn Sona says, um, when you begin to practice, you don't really know why you're doing it, right? You're just being mindful. But if you, so you, you need to, this is one of the reasons why it's important to study the Dharma. Because you start to see how what you're doing fits into the Eightfold Path, the and the, that the path is part of the Four Noble Truths. So getting this whole picture, and, you know, I keep, uh, I, I mean, I've pretty much come to the conclusion that teaching the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path is really all that I want to do, and all that I think people, is what I want people to take away from my teaching. And, and the thing is, that doesn't sound like much, Oh, it's four of this and then eight of that. Great, 12, just like 12 steps, right? But when you drill into each of those 12 things, each of them is a deep and rich teaching that, that can get you so into it that you forget all the rest of it and you forget the bigger context. So, uh, uh, you know, this is why we keep going over this. You know, he talks about how there's just like a layers of learning. Um, he says, he says, you don't have to learn all this at once. But here's a quote. If you stay at this long enough and you're interested enough, you will eventually start to have an overview of the whole thing, which is, as I say, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. That's all he's really talking about. But like, it really takes this persistence. And, and I feel... Like, I'm just figuring that out after 40-some years of practice, which is embarrassing. But, you know, what what one tries to do as one gets older is make it easier for younger people to deal with the things that we dealt with. And some of you aren't that much younger than me, unfortunately. So that might be. But in any case, uh, you know, just this, this idea of... Uh, of that bigger picture, which is something that, you know, Ajahn Sumedho, who is really the teacher of all the people in this book, uh, uh, persistently returns to Sati Sampajana. So a couple things, uh, other things that stand out for me. One of the things that I, uh, I really appreciated and it was a great kind of reminder in this talk uh, is that uh, you know you may be familiar with the uh, the what are called the four heavenly messengers so the things that the Buddha encountered that inspired him to set off on his journey when he was still you know Prince Siddhartha and we talk about the first three a lot, a sickness, old age, and death. And as the mythology goes, the Buddha didn't realize that everybody gets sick, gets old, and dies. And then he's, he saw, he encountered these things. Like he had to leave the palace to, because supposedly he was very protected in his life. And so he got went out and saw a sick person uh, an old person and a dead person and came to understand that these were inevitable uh, realities uh, that were going to happen to him. But the fourth heavenly messenger was a monk or a sadhu that he saw wandering uh, through his home, hometown, Kapalavatu. And then he realized, oh, this is the way, as he, as he came to think, but this is the way to conquer sickness, old age, and death, to, to uh, 
to attain the deathless. And uh, that's a gr great reminder because it's not something I talk about uh, that much or, or think about, the, the importance of that fourth heavenly messenger. Um, what Ajinsona says, because he puts this in the context of, of remembering for a monk to remember, as he puts it, as a monk, one is a sign. You're a walking signboard. <laughs> Do you remember that you're not in the monastery? Do you remember that you're walking in public? Do you remember that people watch you as a sign? This is the form of sati. This is mindfulness and clear comprehension. They go together. So, uh, you know, it's a interesting question for each of us um, to, th to think about, oh, how am I, what am I a sign of right now? What, what is the, is the signboard that I'm, I'm wearing, you know, uh, kind of reminds me of the, uh, you know, the sutta in which the Buddha says one way to let go of your unwholesome thoughts is to imagine that you're walking around with a carcass around your neck and, and that how disgusting that would be and how humiliating that would be embarrassing if people saw that you had these uh, you know unwholesome disgusting thoughts going on in your mind uh, uh, all right um He says, sati, and this is really the key thing, sati without sampajana, so mindfulness without clear comprehension can make you very focused on yourself and not see things in the broader, truer perspective. He compares it to seeing the forest for the trees, not seeing the forest for the trees. You know, such a, a really, really important idea and and i think of it a lot in terms of sort of getting into this idea of holiness or what what makes you really a buddhist i, I gave a talk on sunday to the gay buddhist fellowship about this um there's somebody in the waiting room come on in and how we can get these ideas of oh what's what's it mean to be a Buddhist? Like there, I I read an article about one time about Roseanne Cash. She she was gonna um, she does a regular performance for Tibet House in in New York, a benefit performance. But she said in the, this article, this was some years ago. But I'm not a Buddhist because I eat meat. And I thought, like, you don't understand what a Buddhist is like. And, you know, I know when I began to practice, it was really important to me to, like, have scarves and, like, the right shawl and, and like, you know, the right statues and, like, all these things that I thought made me a Buddhist, right? But meanwhile, I was an alcoholic, <laughs> an addict, and... You know, I was not living a wholesome Buddhist life, you know. So, uh, but it was like about all the trappings, you know, and it was just really uh, misunderstanding. And, and and this, I think, uh, gets at uh, part of what Ajahn Sona is talking about, is really, what really makes sense? What's, what's, the, what's appropriate here? And, you know, when I got sober, it was realizing that I had always wanted to live this sort of exotic life or like some kind of uh, hyper, hyper real, you know, sort of a little beyond unreal life. Uh, and that be getting sober was about living a really or ordinary life and becoming an ordinary person, you know. This is like, I want to be a rock star and I want to be enlightened, an enlightened rock star. <laughs> okay. But I just want to be high all the time too. And like, you know, and a lot of sex would help too, if we could get work that in. So, you know, 
uh, obviously like you know the the reality there was no real perception of reality because in in what was coming out of that the the reality was that i was really unhappy you know <laughs> and my life was not only not only was i emotionally unhappy but but i was materially my life made no sense i was uh, periods of homelessness and you know in, you know i was living in poverty and uh, you know had had nothing uh, which is i mean that's great if you're a monk but i mean i wasn't a monk you know i was just a lay person who couldn't didn't have enough to pay rent and and so the sort of delusion and and we you know we can get really lost in terms of what it, what is spiritual what's it mean to be spiritual and and aa really learned taught me that you know uh that be living in a practical manner in an appropriate manner clear comprehension <laughs> was actually spiritual and that, that was a really important thing for me to to and that's why living by the precepts is spiritual right it, it it's it, spiritual isn't like having the transcendent experience of not self it's like that's great you know but if you're not following the precepts it's not really helping anybody you know it's not really helping you in fact you can really get lost in that so uh, you know that's the that's for me the the bottom line about Ajahn Sona is getting to is like, be realistic, be understand, you know, be be practical. You know, the, being a Buddhist isn't about uh, living in the clouds. It's really about living in the earth, on the earth, and in a body, and with other human beings. So I, I don't even know if I, uh, I you know, the, as I said, I had so many notes on this. Um, oh, there is one more thing I wanted to talk about uh, that really stood out. And, and I think Ann Bolger brought this up. Um, but he said, he says that seeing, he, he talks about, uh, impermanence and he says though that seeing positive things as impermanent misses a huge huge point he says the positive emotional dimension of your life is not to be observed with detachment as something that rises and passes away you are to remain in the field of these positive emotions night and day so that's a to me a very interesting comment that He's not saying, you know, cling to your positive emotions, but he's saying that when the unwholesome arises, what does the Buddha tell us to do with that? If you look at the, the traditional description of right effort, abandon the unwholesome states that have arisen. But then what does he say about the wholesome states that have arisen? He says, maintain the wholesome states that has arisen. He doesn't say observe them and watch them passing. He says try to maintain them. So it's not saying that they're not going to pass. I mean, everything is impermanent. That's, you know, all conditioned things are impermanent. Of course, they're going to pass. But he's, he's not saying just like, oh, breathe and feel that and let it go. He's saying breathe and feel that Take it in. And okay, take it in. Thank you, Charmaine. <laughs> and and you know, stay with it. You know, that's that's uh so really, you know, when we talk about the uh Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, you know, to uh, compassion, uh, stay connected to these things when joy arises, when generosity arises. Uh, so, uh, I think that's a really, uh, useful, uh, reflection for us. And, 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 you know, uh, again, we have to be careful that we're not trying to cling to those things. They, 
they're still going to come and go. Somebody did a lot of typing here. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. <laughs> um, so we're, you know, at the 11 o'clock, so I understand uh, some people will have to leave. Others may choose to leave. I will stick around for a little while for people who want to uh, ask questions or make comments. So the floor is open. Anybody? <laughs> Hi, I'm Robin. Hi. Um, Hi, Robin. Hi. Um, so I'm so new with this. <laughs> um, I'm a baby. I'm one of the babies you're talking to. Um, not that much younger than you in years, but uh, way younger than you as far as practice. I mean, way new. So this is all brand new to me. Um, recovery isn't but the buddhism side of it is and it makes so much sense it's it's profound how much mm -hmm. they go together um hearing you say that balance between not clinging because i get that clinging thing and yet taking it in as someone mm -hmm. said or or holding on to it that that seems like a really kind of a, maybe a tricky balance <laughs> um indeed i i guess maybe i need to just keep coming back I <laughs> yeah i mean I, here's one way to think of it when when you're feeling good enjoy it you know and and notice that it's happening because the negativity bias and particularly for people with the various <laughs> conditions we have as addicts, you know, it can easily jump in there and, um, you know, not, not allow us to really sit with and go, you know, this is really lovely. You know, this is like, like this is a really nice day or this is, uh whatever it is you're enjoying just just take the time to enjoy it i mean uh, it's, I'm, I'm verging on saying uh stop and smell the roses you know but i mean it, it's kind of the kind of the point it's just um and 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 that it's okay to you know actually have the intention in your life to be happy and to make choices that are about being happy rather than about doing the thing that everybody else thinks you should do or, or that society thinks you should do. I mean, within the practical bounds, right? I mean, we all have responsibilities in the world. Uh, you know, but, you know, I was talking to my daughter yesterday who's, uh, you know, she's about to turn 26 and she was at a, she, she lives in Washington and she went up to New York for the weekend for a friend who was having a her like bachelorette weekend with their friends. And my daughter said, it wasn't really fun. And it's not really what I want to do. Like I could tell that she was kind of doing it because that's what she thought she was supposed to do. She said, there's a lot of pressure for young people who are getting married to do all these certain things, you know, and, and, oh, we're going to have a big party and we're going to have a big, you know, we're going to go out and get drunk or we're going to whatever. I'm not getting um, maps. And it just was really interesting to hear that from her because that was exactly what we're talking about, you know, about not, not being what I'm talking about right now, not being pressured to, to make choices that really don't make you happy that just because they look like they should, you know, anyway, that was Debbie, I saw you raising your hand. I want to hear from you. <laughs> you just caught me. I was just needing to head out, but I won't. Oh, get... sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I I don't know. I, I tend to be an optimist. And so 
what I know some people can say I'm not, but either way, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I love this page here, um, page 38, all about, you know, I mean, really getting down to the whole, all these teachings, uh, it, the goal is to, you know, relieve our suffering. And, you know, I would often think of, okay, all the positive things like the Brahma Baharas or the seven factors of awakening, that's on one side and then greed, hatred and delusion is over here. But to say, oh, I can just kind of flux and flow in the abodes. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, can I just be anchored in that? And that's okay because with those, one of those abodes is going to help me meet whatever it is that I am encountering right. in my life. Right. It might that's be right. based in greed, hatred, mm -hmm. delusion, fear, sadness. And so therefore I just feel this like great freedom. Oh, I, I can float over here in, in the resource of, of, of resources of well-being and and it's and i'm not clinging i don't have to cling to it i can just choose that to be the the resourcing so yeah. i don't know something was really inspiring for me about that today well and and the brahma viharas don't suggest that you're supposed to like everything is delightful because the second brahma vihara is about dealing with suffering yes and the uh, you know compassion and then the fourth brahma vihara equanimity is about maintaining some kind of balance in the world in the worldly winds with the worldly winds so there is an acknowledging of and being present with these things but it's not letting them take over that becomes you what you're living in you know uh, yeah. yeah 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 exactly we're meeting it we get to meet it yeah. and go, okay you know do i need my hike my walking stick right now mm -hmm. or do i need my rope or Very good. you know something using yeah the yeah yeah Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Mm -hmm. See you soon. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Nice to see everybody. And uh, I'll be uh, Thursday night at the uh, San Francisco Dharma Collective if you want to tune in or, or drive into San Francisco. Fun place. Great uh, burritos across the street. I've been meeting with some people there, so... Uh, you know, highly recommended. Peace out. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. All right. Bye, Kevin. Have a good day. Okay. I will. Thank you, Kevin. Okay.